Turns out, in my last video, I forgot to use the October Kanikaris intro. Shut up! <laughs> the original ukulele was a game I massively enjoyed and that I feel people were way too harsh towards when it came out. In fact, I did a much more serious and less jokey review on it years ago that you can find right here. And ever since the somewhat depressing reception, I just assumed we'd never see the series again. And then I cried so hard that Platonic themselves sent me a personal letter which said, fine, we'll do Ukulele 2, please stop sending us your salty eye water. And here we are, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. Thank you so much to Platonic for the review code on PC. Now I know what you're thinking, how on earth could this game be possibly associated with the Month of Terror? <laughs> Well, you know what's everywhere this time of year? Bats. And Laylee is a bat, so it's a horror game, okay? Also, every single thing in this game has eyes. If that's not scary, I don't know what is. We cool? We good? Great! Let's play some ukulele! <laughs> The game begins straight away, and you find Yuka and Laylee, our heroes from the last game, having a look around the Royal Stingdom, one of the many worlds in the series represented by a BOOM! And then, the biggest baddie from the last game, capital B, appears from atop a blimp ready to cause more trouble, I'm sure. All of a sudden, the queen of this world, known as Phoebe, <laughs> comes down and explains that capital B has the means to enslave every bee in this world to be used as his soldiers, using a mind control device called the Hive Mind. <laughs> and I do love how capital B has all the time in the world to just let us chat about this whole thing while he stands there doing nothing. Eventually though he decides that sitting around and letting the heroes discuss battle tactics isn't a good idea at all and thrusts us into the intro level, acting as a tutorial to the game. As you can see, unlike the original ukulele, we're no longer free roaming around a fully 3D open environment collecting stuff, we're now in a 2D side-scroller, but with more restrictive movement that doesn't mean we aren't on top form. I mean, unlike the original game, Yuka can even swing on ropes now- oh. Is it a little bit possible that you all noticed a few B puns up to this point? Because I don't know if you did, there, there's not that many of them. b tally and b enforcements kick his behind, devious plan B, invincibility. Oh, what? No invincibility? Well, that sucks. I think it would have been much honeyer to use that one, and because you didn't use that, I think there's some sting wrong with your business! So I carry on for a bit, get to the end, kick capital B around in a pretty easy boss battle, head through a door, and straight away I'm dead. Whoa, it's the survival horror! I told you this game is scary! Well, actually, that was supposed to happen, because it turns out we were just given access to the final level of the game, the impossible lair. Yes, the game started you at the end, and so because Yuka and Laylee are dumb and didn't think that they may have struggled inside a place literally called the Impossible Lair, Queen Phoebe had to save them at the last minute. She then explains that in order for us to chase after capital B again in this lair, we'll need a lot of assistance from her b Talion, a collection of tiny B warriors acting as extra hit points to shield Yuka and Laylee from any and all damage. But unfortunately, after the tutorial, capital B captured all of these bees and locked them in different chapters inside the Royal Stingdom book that he's hiding in. So after the Queen manages to get the chapters out of the book, which didn't go completely to plan. We then begin our quest to search around a giant hub world, find the missing chapters, rescue every bee inside them by beating the level, and then go back into the lair with all of them by our side, acting as extra hit points to stop capital B from taking over the bees. This game is basically a giant metaphor for saving the bees, yeah. and that's a cause I can get down with. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I love bees. I think they're adorable. I mean, just ask me back in 2015 with my old Vine account. There are bees everywhere. Bees. It's Please. I'm really sorry you had to see that. Saving the bees aside, is Ukulele and the Impossible Lair a good game? Well, if you're asking me, I think it's pure brilliance. It's way better than the first one, and this is coming from someone who really, really enjoyed the first one. And how do you know you can take my word for it? Because on this bit of the game, I was supposed to grab a secret by bombing a wall and then running around the back of the cave to get it, but instead I did it the wrong way and jumped over the gap. I'm hardcore, I know what I'm talking about. So where the original ukulele was basically Banjo-Kazooie again, I mean, it's essentially the same team that made it, Ukulele 2 instead goes for a sort of mix between Donkey Long Country- <laughs> Thanks, word. Donkey Long. <laughs> and Yoshi's Island, most notably with how you can grab items with your tongue and spit them out back at others, the fact that you do quite a lot of jumping ground pounds for the environment and the hit point system, because much like Baby Mario in Yoshi's Island, if you get hit, you lose Laylee for a sec and you need to grab her again in a short amount of time before losing her forever. Why on God's green earth doesn't she just come back to you? What do you benefit from behaving like this, bat? Oh look, I lost you, now I'm in danger! Why do you do this? Who are you helping? Difference is though, you can carry on even if you lose your partner, unlike Yoshi 
Yoshi, who doesn't want to carry on without his lunch, and that ability to carry on with or without your partner isn't the only place it starts to feel a lot like Donkey Kong Country. Funny again, considering that that is another originally rare developed title like Banjo-Kazooie was. So that means if there isn't a ukulele first person shooter in the works, I'm gonna shit. Not only is it a 2D scroller, but there's a lot of those automatic and manual fire barrels in the air that whiz you around, plenty of swimming sections, a few sliding sections where you jump from vine to vine while flipping between different heights, the rope swinging, background climbing sections, and of course, the main attack you'll be doing from start to end, the rolling. Which goes as far as allowing you to do that neat mid-air jump after rolling off edges to feel even more like Donkey Kong. There are hundreds of secrets hidden behind walls and scenery in the foreground, you bounce on enemies' heads to reach higher places and grab collectibles, this truly feels like an indie dev's response to Donkey Kong. Unlike Donkey Kong though, you don't get multiple partners to find and use with different abilities, you just have Laylee. She's your permanent fixture and I wouldn't describe her as a power-up, you begin every stage with her. But that doesn't mean she's useless or only exists as an extra hit point for you, if that were the case there wouldn't be any of those bells to call her back if she vanishes off screen after you get hit. With her, you not only get the extra hit, but also get the ability to ground slam and do a mid-air twirl for a tiny bit of extra distance in the air, so playing carefully is majorly rewarded. I mean it's totally possible to finish a stage as Yuka alone, but it's better to have the duo together, so try keeping it that way. Especially since the enemy behaviours are all over the place, some jump in the air whenever you jump or attack, some charge at you and can't be harmed from the front, some fly, some give you Koopa Shell style projectiles, some just get in your way by bouncing you back or messing with platforms, some can only be fired at with an item or door slammed, and others want to make you crap out a kidney. These crabs man, I tell ya, they're worse than crabs. But if it does get a little frustrating or starts to feel too much like another Donkey Kong game, the main thing that makes it shine past anything negative as far as I'm concerned are the controls. You want to know how I know they're so good? Swimming in this game is actually fun. That's how I know. For me, when it comes to Donkey Kong Country games, the defining factor that makes me never enjoy them as much as older Mario games is the control. I do love a bit of DKC, don't get me wrong, but the weight and physics of those games I really don't like that much. Impossible Lair though, I've got to say, I prefer massively over DKC's controls. You carry a lot less momentum and weight than in DKC, making it far easier to move freely and position yourself exactly where you need to be at a moment's notice. Without the worry of slipping off of things, awkwardly positioning myself too slowly at the last minute or dropping down too fast. I know this is why so many millions love DKC games and I still do too, but for how many precise and tight platforming sequences those games can have, the controls are far from my preference. It's hard to describe just how good Yuka feels to play. You don't flow, but you're not too heavy. Your jump arc is exactly how you'd expect. Turning around and slowing yourself down after gaining speed, running or rolling is responsive and fast. Hell, even with the rolling, I can control my momentum more in Yuka and don't get carried away because the only way to keep a roll going perpetually in Yuka is to keep smashing into enemies and objects, otherwise it's more like a short dash, and again, unlike Donkey Kong, Yuka can perpetually roll on his own without Laylee. So yeah, you may be one hit away from death, but at least you're not completely defenseless whenever Laylee leaves the screen, unlike Donkey Kong who loses quite a lot of abilities when he hasn't got a partner with him. Again, making Laylee feel more like an extension to Yuka's abilities instead of an essential power-up. She has a lot of benefits and it's good to keep her, but losing her is nowhere near near as much of a pain as losing a partner is in Donkey Kong. You can even tail whip when standing still, so attacking while needing to be still isn't a hassle. Hot damn, did I just say I prefer this over Donkey Kong Country? But Donkey Kong Country has funky mode in it. I'm gonna need to lay low for a while. Am I safe? Has the internet gone? Oh wait. I don't need to hide from the internet anymore because I'm using ExpressVPN on my phone, my tablet, and my computer. Did you know that VPN stands for voila? Pinch nose. ExpressVPN are the sponsors of today's video and they're a service that completely shields you from the perils of everyday internet use at home or more importantly, public Wi-Fi. Protecting your bank details, usernames and passwords from this man. It doesn't just save you from hacking attempts either. Take me for instance. I'm an alpha gamer bro and I'm constantly downloading games, playing online with randoms and using all sorts of online services that have been known to be DDoS attacked. But with ExpressVPN and their data encryption, I'm not only protected from damage if those events do occur, but I'm safe in the knowledge that I'm getting the fastest possible speeds on the VPN market, and that no matter where I am in the world, I can connect to any one of the 94 different countries' servers. I used it earlier today just so I could check out what games were releasing earlier in other countries because ExpressVPN removes geo restrictions based on your location, and my lord, the USA Netflix lineup. There's so much more stuff here than in the UK version, and I'm not sure why that is. 
Maybe it's because the UK hates us. Find out how you can get three months free and take your internet privacy back today by clicking the link in the description box below. ExpressVPN.com forward slash caddy. I love it, other trusted websites love it, and I'm sure you'll love it too. Oh no, looks like the internet physically came to my front door and are bashing it down because I said I prefer this over DKC, so I better carry on quick. Undoubtedly, the coolest thing in the impossible lair is the impossible lair itself, which you can access from the very beginning of the game and where you can use all the bees you rescued as extra hit points to make things a little bit easier. The lair acts as the ultimate challenge of the game and it goes on for what feels like a good half an hour, with the hardest platforming in the entire game and even four separate boss encounters with capital B after every section of it, which also get harder the closer to the end you get. In case you're wondering, yes, I did try doing it after only rescuing one bee. And I beat it. Finish the game. See you next week! Well... I sort of beat it. Okay, yeah, so I was pretty useless at it, but I still think it's cool that you have the choice to tackle it whenever you want to. If you feel like you can tackle it, or you feel like you've played enough of the game, you can just go for it. In fact, one of the game's unlocks requires you doing it all without saving a single B on a brand new save file, so the impossible lair is most certainly possible, just not very easy in the slightest. It's an endurance test to the max and allows you to truly demonstrate everything you've learned throughout the whole game, and even after I decided to rescue every single B, because, I mean, I was gonna see everything the game had to offer me anyway. I got 48 additional hits, 48, yet still had to retry the entire stage seven times, and I still took 46 hits worth of damage. God damn, if you've done this without rescuing a single bee or even taking a hit, I demand pictures. Just to give you an idea how extreme this really is, you could spend 25 minutes reaching the final boss, maybe longer than that, and then beat it only to then fail at the final sprint section while everything explodes around you, and if you die, you need to start from the beginning of the lair all over again, bosses included. It's a little sadistic and a major difficulty mountain, but I won't lie when I say the adrenaline I got dashing through the final sections with barely any hits remaining made me physically shake and it felt euphoric to finally finish it. It's also just really cool to see the things you've collected throughout the game actually contributing as a gameplay mechanic to the final hurdle, and the attempt count and percentage bar give you a great idea on not only how well you're doing for the just one more time mentality and the competitive aspect, but it also gives you the chance to work out a ratio of percentage through the level to how many bees you'd potentially need to rescue for another attempt, just in case you don't want to go for every single bee and you can get relatively far without that many bees to begin with. What's that? You still don't think ukulele is a horror game? Well how about you take a look at the first thing you see after you fail an attempt at the impossible lair? <laughs> Getting to the other levels in the game doesn't just require finishing the last ones though. You also need to get past Trouser the Snake, hands down the best character in all of Ukulele, just for his voice alone. Yeah, yeah. But why is he called Trouser? Don't get the pun? Well don't worry, I'll show you what they mean! In the original game, he was the guy that you could buy new moves from with the quills you collected, but in this game, you have to give him some of the limited twit coins you find in each stage to get past these barriers that he calls paywalls. There are five Twit coins hidden in each stage to find, so you can go back to the hub world and buy your way past him. He's basically mm. money bags from Spyro but not named after a prick. Unlike Moneybags though, in my opinion, Trouser is far more lovably hateable since he has the absolute gall to flaunt the cash he's taking from you and buys pointless things for himself while you're standing right next to him. You don't ever get the coins back, but hey, at least when he buys a barbecue, he ends up burning his entire house down. Serves you right. Could you at least pass me a sausage? Don't need to, Trouser. You already are one. I suppose I'd better find some more coins in the other levels to make up for him wasting them all. And hey, look at that. I managed to find them all in this stage. <laughs> Ooh, what was that new thing? Oh, oh an instrument. Oh, what's that instrument? What is this? Banjo Louie? Gotta make one thing abundantly clear though. The impossible lair looks fantastic. Not just the 1080p 60fps gameplay from the Steam version review copy that you've been watching me play. Yeah, I haven't even touched the Switch version. I just wanted to show support to Playtonic. Game's great. I'm just talking about the style of the game in general. Character designs, environments, light effects, detail. It's so great. If you weren't a massive fan of the five worlds, six if you include the hub world, in the original ukulele, and weren't too keen on how long you'd be exploring the same themed visuals in each location and getting the missions done, I'm happy to report that the impossible lair will blow you. Out of the water. 
I, I wrote down blow you out of the water. I, I meant I meant to say blow you out of the water. There is so much variety in the stages and they're also beautifully crafted. There's so many stage themes, colors, enemy types. Each level in all the books you jump into feels like its own contained mini universe. The foreground is busy and lively without being a headache and keeping it obvious on what's interactable. And the backgrounds have so many little details and animations poured into them. It's actually a shame you'll mostly be blasting by them or focusing directly on what's in front of you. I mean, I do find it a little confusing how Roland gets you underneath objects and yet Laylee somehow clips through the object anyway, but at the same time, this is also a game with a bee called Willycomb. I'll say that again, a bee called Willycomb. So whatever, this is fine. And you know me, with any kind of video game visuals, I'm obsessed with the effort dedicated to the little things. The level flagpole sinking when you walk over them and then rising up again with sparks, and the fire looking like 2D animated paper. I also love how the checkpoint marker is a 3D scanner that captures the exact frame of animation Yuka and Laylee were in when they fly by. It's a world where planks of wood have eyes, purple feather quills throw up smaller versions of themselves, bushes give birth to bombs, fans say hooray when they're blowing and get upset when they're not, enemies live in houses with framed pictures of characters they hate, and the bees live in houses decorated with more bees. Oh, that reminds me, I need to wallpaper the living room! Even the individual bees you rescue for the bee tally and all have names and brief descriptions like the monkeys in Ape Escape, and countdown timers sound like this. <laughs> Not that this has anything to do with anything, but I really love how Yuka looks when he's holding something in his mouth. He looks like my dog holding a rubber ring the wrong way. Hey there, Stan. <laughs> You're right there, buddy. Gotta say though, this music, my god, this music. And that, that was just for the tutorial stage. It gets better from there. They knocked it out of the ballpark once again. So all of you on the screen right now. I loved the more atmospheric tracks from the original game to accompany the long sequences of exploration in one location and not annoy the hell out of you. But Impossible Layers music takes it into overdrive. Not only because it knows exactly when to be atmospheric, but it also knows when to be energetic, mysterious, bouncy, daunting, groovy, chilled and aggressive exactly when it needs to be. And all the tracks individually are a great listen with their varied instrumentation and weaving melodies. They all stand out. I found myself humming to many of them even if they were more ethereal and droning. And they even get away on the occasion remixing memorable themes from the previous game. The level design is, well, have you played Donkey Kong Country? Did you think they had creative levels with plenty of stuff to platform around? Extremely tough but fair sections with tricky enemy placements? Many environmental hazards that can be used to your benefit? Lots of horizontal and vertical platforming challenges centered around running, jumping, swimming and climbing? A few times you get to directly affect the environment around you to progress and plenty of cartoony satisfying action? If yes, then you'll love Ukulele too. It's more or less Donkey Kong in design as much as some of the mechanics. You mostly get left to right affairs where you simply make your way to the interesting 
rescue a bee, and on the rare occasion, by which I mean twice, there's levels that make you search down five individual branching paths from a centre point in order to grab keys and bring them back to the middle to rescue the bee. In each level there isn't even a massive checklist of items to collect, only the five twit coins and the bee at the very end, which not only makes the game flow a lot better without so much stopping and searching for a million collectibles, but also lets you focus on all the challenges in front of you. Difficult moments in this game are mostly down to the platforming and not as much where the twit coins are hiding and how you reach them. I mean, the game does have them, but they're pretty occasional compared to the amount of Donkey Kong's absurd stipulations for getting all the puzzle pieces and Kong letters. You can still get mileage out of every stage by exploring though, and curiosity is rewarded, but it's mostly with a buttload of quills, which are optional to grab depending on how much you want to alter the game with purchasable upgrades. So you aren't missing too much if you just want to have fun and not search every single wall, which is still more fun for me to do than in Donkey Kong Country anyway because of the buttery controls. And despite the 2D plane, many stages still offer you a lot to work with. There are puzzles and secret areas requiring you to grab a particular projectile and then going back through the level to use it, making sure you don't kill the correct enemies in order to bounce on them on the return trip to reach the higher areas, and parts where you grab the projectile and have to use it further on in the stage while making sure not to get hit and potentially lose the item before you're able to use it. Luckily though, you can still save the item if you're quick enough. Oh baby, did you see that? Oh, come on now, how did I even do that? I don't even know. Those are some tight hitboxes. Ukulele is better than Dark Souls 2. The Twit coins themselves are sometimes hidden in dastardly places that make you go, ooh, cheeky. And other times they're on screen waiting for you to grab by taking a small diversion to find a secret entrance to an area or by taking a risk against a group of enemies defending the coin. And I like this, since you need to buy your way past paywalls regardless, it's nice that those players who don't want to go out of their way to complete everything are accounted for by giving them very easy to spot and grab coins that are delved out just often enough to get you by comfortably. But with a little bit of extra searching just in case you're a few coins out of reach for a paywall. There are even some secret exits to a few levels to rescue more bees in the hub world. Did I mention this was like Donkey Kong? Because it is. It, this, is, this is Donkey Kong. I mentioned earlier that quills are used to buy equipable upgrades and you can get them from the returning character Vendy the Vending Machine. No, sorry, Vendy the Big Chunk of Cheese. And where these are useful, this means you can grab as many as you want. The pace is up to you. What's that? You still don't think ukulele is a horror game? Well, take another look at Vendy. <laughs> If you do decide to grab as many quills as you can though, the amount the game showers you in for completing tiny side objectives like with finding the coloured ghost quills doesn't only feel rewarding since the quills do have a very valuable use for upgrading yourself, but are also just immensely fun to do in the middle of a stage. Especially since every ghost quill has a different method of spitting out quills around the stage under different time limits, and all work themselves around the already fun levels. In particular, they like to activate near enemies and difficult platforming bits, so it's nice to just get that extra reward for doing a difficult thing you are already going to do. And by the time you find them, activate them and beat them, you've taken a sidestep in the level that lasted less than 10 seconds. Also, some of the ghost quills have twit coins as rewards, so it's worth trying to find and complete them all anyway. And if there's no coin, there's a dump truck of quills to reward you. Even the hub world, the means to pick which level you want to play, is in itself a giant level, but top down. It has enemies to fight, it has dozens of secrets to uncover, shortcuts looping you back to earlier parts of the world, and you can do most of the same moves in the main stages, but just with a more restrictive jump for the sake of not being able to break the puzzles. This is how you do it, Mario 3D World. This, this feels like a mini Zelda game. There's a shocking amount to do here. It's actually here where you can find all the upgrade tonics that you can then later buy from Vendy in the pause menu. And there's over 60 of them. Yeah, it's huge and it's great. You can even find hidden extra bees that you can usually only get from regular levels. There's side quests to do too with these challenge rooms hosted by the main collectible from Ukulele 1. Pages. He got my friend. After talking to them, you get thrown into a challenge room where every enemy needs to be bopped with you only having two hits before needing to restart. And if successful, the pages just float around and magic themselves everywhere with this dumbass expression on their face. I love them. But this also means they alter the hub world even further so you can reach even more levels and secret areas for tonics and bees. I know that pieces of paper being able to do this makes no sense at all and that they've essentially gone from a collectible in the first game to a godlike deity in this one. But to be honest, if I had this character model, I'd use it in every game I ever made. So what about those tonics? Well, there's over 60 of them, and damn do they change things up. They can be as useful as Laylee staying around longer when you take a hit, longer invincibility frames, making the 12 jump damage enemies, no slipping on ice, and this amazing gliding spin jump that saved my life many a time, or completely useless like Big Head Yuka or the Plethora. 
the utter bacterial infestation of filters and aspect ratios. I won't lie, some of them were really cute and could even be mixed together since you can equip three tonics on your person at any given time, but most of the time they were totally useless and almost funny when considering that someone will use them for speedruns and will hate every second of it. Or you can slow down the entire stage if you're an insomniac and need to find a way to fall asleep. But even this tonic system has its own perks to consider. You see, if you're struggling with the game and save up your quills for an upgrade that actively helps you out, like extra checkpoints or something, that ends up subtracting from the potential quills you can earn in the stages, then making it harder to save up for future upgrades if you have a helpful one equipped. On the flip side, if you equip a tonic like giving enemies one more hit point, but also googly eyes, you get even more quills on top of what you collect instead of subtracting them. And I didn't think the extra hit point enemies was too hard since it gave me another chance to reach a higher platform secret by bouncing on them in case I messed it up the first time. The more tonics you equip to make the game harder, the more quills you get as a reward to purchase more of the tonics you find in the overworld. More risk, more reward. It's a great system, and if you don't massively care about buying any more upgrades if you already have what you want to make the game easier, you can just keep them equipped until the end of the game because you no longer care about saving more quills for other upgrades. The balance is perfect. Well, except for the broken controller tonic. Seriously, every control being reversed for the sake of plus 0.3 times more quills for a stage is not worth it. Put it this way, the extra hit point enemy tonic gives you plus 1.5 times more. But at least the quill magnet tonic doesn't affect your quill count at all, which is awesome because it's easily the best tonic in the game and allows you to skip tons of trickier precise platforming segments because you can just make the quills float towards you, even through walls. It even makes the ghost quill challenge is 10 times easier and allows you to grab every single quill they drop to award you with insane payouts. Seeing as there's also treasure chests in the hub world that contain keys and side quest items that need to be paid for to open with quills, yeah, quill magnet was the best tonic for me by far. You can even spend tiny amounts of quills at the wooden plank signs with eyes so they can give you hints on where the tonics are hidden in the hub world. What they're gonna do with the feather quills, I have no idea. Maybe they'll put them on their heads or something. <gasps> With all this being said though, do you think you'll make the impossible let easier for yourself by equipping tonics? <laughs> you can't. What's that? You still don't think ukulele's a horror game? Well, I found a cauldron pop that sounds like Johnny Vegas. PG Tips T is completely natural. This is the scariest game I've ever played. You can even do this brilliant thing to the levels in the hub world in yet another side quest by utilising certain characters, setting a book on fire, freezing it, pushing things in front of it, turning on machines near it, basically anything you can think of, you unlock an alternate version of the same stage for every stage, and it's completely different to play in basically every way, just with the same enemies and themed obstacles. They're rearranged with new visuals and brand new scenarios with special handicaps, more challenges, more twit coins to collect, they're brand new levels, but accessed in a similar way to how Mario 64 allowed you to change aspects of the same level depending on how you entered the painting. When the game wants to get difficult though, it really does get difficult, with the chase segments especially. These moments are always blood pumping and often furnish- <laughs> What's wrong with word today? That's supposed to say frustrating, why did you autocorrect that? And the alternate stages are often harder to make you boil over even more. It's never unfair, just really hard, and luckily you get unlimited lives, along with very quick load times after death, so it feels a lot like Super Meat Boy in some instances with how quickly you can retry tricky moments. Also good because every time you die, you lose all the items you grabbed up until your last checkpoint. Except for me. My game broke at one point and I didn't lose anything every time I died, so take that. Twit banker. That rhymes with something, doesn't it? Oh no, don't worry, looks like the glitch fixed itself. Oh! Looks like I'm gonna need a twit bank after all. Towards the end of the game, it will test you to the limit, not just for finding and grabbing collectibles that sometimes require sacrificing Laylee to reach them, but with just finishing the levels themselves. You'll be thrown into some do or die situations with plenty of timed hazards, moving platforms and disappearing platforms, often all together, but with these controls, it feels so good to pull it all off. Well, when the enemies want to attack you anyway. He's a bit shy. What's that? You... Still don't think ukulele is a horror game? Well, I found a ghost quill that sounds like Wallace! Jeez! So how about I turn the game upside down with Game Boy Colors and Game Boy Resolution? This is unplayable. So there we go. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. I definitely prefer this over any Donkey Kong Country game I've ever played. 
Yeah, I'm sorry guys, I'm just being honest. Yes, this does mean it has some of the DKC trappings like non-backtracking doors, which means if you've missed a secret or something, you can't just go back through the level, you have to restart the whole thing over again. That's kind of annoying, but it's nowhere near as bad as Donkey Kong, and to be honest, I'd recommend this over Tropical Freeze any day of the week. I know, I was given a PC review copy, but I just bought myself this on the Switch just to have anyway, to show support to the devs, and to give myself a version to play while I'm on the go. It's that good. So yeah, if Ukulele 1 didn't sell you, I'm pretty sure that this will. Give it a go. I mean... What could possibly go wrong? Okay, Platonic, I take that back. Go bankrupt. Oh, perfect. Now the internet has fully broken through my door. Looks like I'm about to die. Bye, everyone! <laughs>